further ado, I would like to talk to you about your giants. I want you to notice how I said your giants. So I think we're all familiar with the story of David and Goliath. You know, a pretty big dude versus a small dude with a sling. You know, he's all that. And the fun thing about David is that he was the youngest out of all of his brothers. And you know, being the youngest, his dad sent him out into the field to watch sheep. But David wasn't your ordinary younger brother, teenager, whatever you want to call him. Well, first of all, he was attacked by a lion and a bear. He single-handedly defeated those both. So, like, this dude is not afraid of nothing. And then he would later go and face on a giant. So, I'm just saying, this guy's nuts. <laughs> Speaking of the giant, they said Goliath was nine cubits tall, which, if you do the math, is 9.75 feet tall. That's me with Gideon on my shoulders. So this dude is tall, and we got David, who is a smaller teenager, who is estimated to be about five feet tall. And even with a huge disadvantage, David still goes out there to go face him. With us, the roles are switched. We have the advantage. We have the blood. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God. We have, his, we have God's mercy, forgiveness, and strength. Even, not even Goliath could beat. So why am I speaking on this topic? You have to face your giants. Because Goliath, when they were down there, he practically stopped a whole nation from moving and carrying on on what they do. It said that every person in the camp got all the 12 tribes around. They were all scared of this dude. And if you let your giant stop you, you're going to be like Israel, and you're not going to be able to move, and you won't be able to let the spirit move in you. So you need God to help you there. You have God's will, and you have God's purpose. If God can do it for David, he can do it for you. For we, like David, come in the name of the Lord's armies. Thank you for letting me speak, and God bless you all. God's good. Amen. I should just let uh, Brother Luke take my notes. I'm preaching on the same thing, praise God. Amen. Isn't God, God good how he works that way? Amen. God is so good. I give honor unto our pastors. Give honor unto the leadership of this church, the ministry of this church. And, you know, I've, I've enjoyed uh, these last uh, several weeks of, of hearing the, the five spots and the, uh, the other ministry uh, minister unto us and speak from their hearts and what God has, has given to them and spoken to them and and I'm, I'm humbled to be a, and thankful to be a part of that. And I truly believe that God is, is going to do something here tonight. Praise God. You know, I've, my family's been battling some, as most of us have, but it seems like it's been for about a month and a half. And, uh, you know, I finally got rid of this, this cough. And, you know, the probably uh, Monday or so it, it, it went away. But, of course, it uh, wanting to rear its ugly head again on me tonight. So if I, uh, I have to pause a moment, please forgive me. Amen. It's probably the peanut M&Ms that we ate on the way to church tonight. <clears throat> God is good. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start a little, a little further ahead. Verse 34. Amen. I just like how God works. He knows what we have need of. Amen. He, has, he knows what we have need of. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, 
seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your presence, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for unity of your word, O oh God. I thank you, Lord, for helping me tonight to bring forth what you have for us. I thank you, Lord, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. You know, I, to title this message, it's basically the battle is the Lord's. I know, real creative, right? You know, I, I thought about naming it or titling it. I'm not one for titles per se, but I'm not real creative in that aspect. But, you know, been there, done that, no T-shirt kind of a thing. Because uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a very uh, well-known portion of Scripture and, and story that we've learned. Uh, if you've been in church most of your life, you know, it was well taught in, in Sunday school and, and it was, uh, you know, spoken upon and ministered upon many, many, many a times. And, and, but the story never gets old to me. You know, David is one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, Bible characters per se. Not that he's necessarily a, a fictional character, but, you know, his life is a testament to how good God truly is to his, his people. You know, we make mistakes. We, we sometimes don't always hit the mark, but God is merciful. God is, is caring. He cares for his people. He loves us. He sees right where we're at. And even though we, we may not get it right all the time, we can still be a man or woman after God's own heart. You know, David, he was the only one who was able to, to be in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant without going through the rituals that the high priest had to go through only certain times of the year. He was, uh, he was the one that was able to dwell in the presence of the Lord because he had a heart that wanted to please the Lord. Even from a young age, you know, a lot of his psalms that he, he wrote or songs that he sung as he was, he was shepherding the sheep of his father. And so we read in, in 1 Samuel, uh, I'm going to kind of jump around here and kind of skip through some of this just uh, for, for sake of time. But it's uh, verse 3 of, of Samuel chapter 17 uh, you know, it says that they stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a, a mountain on the other side. And, of course, there was a valley in between them. As, uh, and there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. Um, he was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet. I'll go, I'll go into a little bit more into detail of, of that. He was arm, well armored. Let's just put it that way. He had greaves brasses upon his legs, a target of brass between his shoulders. He had a big old staff, a weaver's beam. He had a and a spearhead that weighed uh, 600 shekels of iron, and he had actually somebody who carried his shield before him. And so uh, you can imagine uh, he was all weighed down with all this protection, all this, this uh, armor, all this, this weaponry that he couldn't even carry the shield. He had to have somebody else bear the shield uh, before him. And so uh, he stood and cried out the, unto the armies of Israel, and, and they said, you know, why are you come out to set the battle in array? You know, I'm a Philistine, you are servants of Saul, so why don't you choose you out a man and, and come fight with me. And whoever wins, you know, if, if you guys win, I'll be, we'll be your servants. And if I win, uh, you guys will be our servants. And, and of course, they were all greatly afraid. And, and David, he was a, uh, the last youngest son of, of eight children of, of Jesse. And I'm down in verse 12 now, if you're following along. And, and Jesse basically says, you know, why don't you go out and... and uh, uh, bring some cheese and some bread to your, to your brothers and to the captain and, and help feed the army. And, and so uh, Jesse, he, he went out and had somebody uh, watch his sheep, and he went out and, and, and met them and, and spoke unto them. And, and uh, he rose up early, got a keeper of the sheep. This is verse 20, if you're following along. He came to the trench and Host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. And for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage to kind of go down and see what, what was going on and what was happening. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion and the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name. And he spake unto the same words that, uh, uh, that he had been saying uh, day in and day out. And David heard them. And, and all, the Israel, uh, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. 
And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man speaking unto to one another? And then also David heard and asked. And, you know, he comes out defying. And, and whoever, uh, the king says, whoever uh, defeats him, that, that he's going to give him uh, basically a, a tax-free life. Him and his family is going to give him one of his daughters uh, to marry. And, and, uh, and so David was, was there listening. And, and, and Eliab, in verse 28, his eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And and he said, uh, why camest thou down hither, and, and whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, but thou art come down that thou, thou might seest the battle. I'm building on something here. Just give me a minute. But I had a thought, or something that, that kind of, you know, if I was in David's shoes, and, and maybe this would be a disrespectful thing to say, but... Uh, you know, his brother was, was basically jabbing at him, saying that you've come just to kind of poke your nose where it doesn't belong. And, and, uh, and basically just it's because of pride and everything else that you have come down that you might see us the battle. And I would have just said, well, it's been 40 days and there hasn't been much of a battle yet. Where's the battle? It's been 40 days. This giant comes out, defies the, uh, speaks uh, poorly about the God that you serve and and you guys haven't done a single thing about it except cower in fear. But maybe that's just the fleshly part of me. David apparently had a, a little more uh, uh, mannerisms to him. And so, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, that was just my, my thought. There hasn't been much going on yet. So there ain't much to see. And David says, what have I done? Is there not a cause? In verse 29, and, and so he spake unto the uh, after the man, same manner, and the, the people heard him, they, they basically spoke unto Saul. And, and uh, David said to Saul in verse 32, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David said, you're, you know, you're just a youth. You cannot fight. And then that's when we, we pick up in verse 34 where, where David speaks about keeping his father's sheep. There came a lion. There came a bear. And plucked out a lamb out of the flock. You know, I don't know if you're well versed in, in uh, zoology in, in the land of Israel right now, but I don't believe there is any lions that are presently there. Um, and so I did a little bit of research, and, and you know, school's coming up, so I figured we might as well have a biology lesson, you know, uh, to get the, the kids prepared. <clears throat> Actually, Renee's in biology this year, so uh, to get her prepared. But most likely it was the Asiatic, if I pronounce that right, lion that was present in that time. It wasn't like the African lion uh, that, that we normally see on in, in, you know, the National Geographic's magazines and stuff of that nature. You know, they've got the flowing long manes and... and uh, you know, just the image of a lion. You know, if you think of a lion, that's what you think of as that lion. And so uh, these lions, they didn't have as, as much of a, 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 if I could talk, a magnificent mane. They weren't much to look at per se. Uh, but we do know that there's 119 verses in the Bible that contain the word lion. So we do know they existed in the time of the Bible. Second Samuel 23 speaks of a man who slew a lion in the pit in the time of snow. We can read in, in Judges 14 about Samson, how he slew a lion and then later uh, found a, a beehive within the, the carcass of that lion. Daniel, we know about the Daniel and the lion's den. And so we know for fact, just going by what the Bible says, that there were truly lions in the Bible. They were, they were killed off. They were pushed off. There's still some kind of in the area, but they're not right where uh, they they were in the, you know, in the, the time of the, the Bible that, that it speaks of, not in Jerusalem or Israel or anywhere of that nature. The Asiatic lion, the roar can be heard from five miles away. Speed and burst up to 50 miles per hour. Now, the average human can run about six miles an hour. Can leap 36 feet, weight around 400, 450 pounds, nine and a half feet long, and about three and a half feet high at the shoulder. David speaks of a bear. Now, there still is bears in the area, but most likely it was a Syrian brown bear, which was a subspecies of the brown bear that we know. 
was known to be aggressive, especially when protecting its young. Same type of bear mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 2 when Elisha cursed the young children for mocking him, and we, we read that two she-bears came out and tear the 42 of the children. Speed about 30 miles an hour, weight up to 550 pounds, length about five feet. Interesting enough, it's the only bear to have white claws. I guess so when it's coming at your face, you can say, man, those are some pretty claws. <laughs> it's pretty. And then we meet Goliath. His brother Luca mentioned he's about nine foot tall, a little taller. He actually had a mixture of, of armor. His greaves, which were a type of leg armor, were commonly worn by the Aegean cultures. His helmet was like that of the Assyrians, weighing about 30 pounds. His scale armor was akin to Egyptian armor, weighing in at about uh, 100 to 150 pounds. His sword was likely sim similar to an eastern scimitar, a curved single-edged sword uh, used a lot in the Asia uh, area. He also carried a spear weighing around 30 pounds. Uh, he had, as I spoke, he had someone who bore his shield before him. So David speaks about these two beasts that he went up against in the field while keeping his father's sheep. And then we see this giant who in our eyes, you know, would probably be a pretty uh, a scary spectacle to, to look at, especially when he's uh, being, you know, all aggressive and all, you know, come out and fight me and, and see what you can do. And he's, it'd be one thing if he, if he didn't have any armor on him and didn't have another guy carrying around a shield. But I could see how he could be pretty intimidating uh, sitting there just all armored up and, and ready to go. And, and you're thinking, well, how in the world is anybody going to defeat him? How is anybody going to be able to uh, defeat this giant who's, who's well armored, well equipped, and well prepared? As, as uh, King Saul said, you know, told David, you're just a youth, and he was a, a warrior from his youth. He had lots of experience, and he had lots of uh, uh, wars that were in his past, and, and lots of strength, and lots of skill, but he was a man. He was a man. So who would you rather go up in a fight against? You ever fought a bear? You ever fought a lion? Anybody ever had a little scuffle with their siblings? Oh, I have a brother who's not, you know, he's about a year, year and a half, a little over than, than me. And we had, uh, I could think of our childhood, we had many, many of uh, intense wrestling matches. But I got to think about it. You know, after a while, you, you get to know the moves of your enemy. You know if they usually attack first, or are you the one who attacks first? Is he going to lead with the right, or is he going to lead with the left? You know, is he going to try to try to kick you? Is he going to try to just tackle you to the ground and try to pin you down? And, and you know, these are all some things that, that we know how a human fights. We know how a human moves. We know how a, how a human reacts and, and how he, uh, uh, you know, even with a sword and a, and a spear, you know, we know what he could do with that spear. We know what he could do with that sword. We know what the shield's for. We know where the weakness is in the armor. But have you ever fought a lion? Have you ever fought a bear? See, David's biggest battle wasn't Goliath. Because Goliath was limited to fighting like a man. He can't leap very far. He can't run very fast. He moves just like a man. David's, big, David's biggest battle was what he had fought in the wilderness, preparing himself for Goliath. David's biggest fight, even though Goliath was so tall and so much bigger and so much stronger, was nothing compared to fighting beasts out in the wilderness by yourself was nothing like, uh, you know, chasing after something that just grabbed a hold of one of your father's sheep. That bear and that lion attacked for survival's sake. It wasn't just for sport. It wasn't just for fun. That was the, what the food that was going to keep that lion or keep that bear healthy and strong. 
You know how hungry we can get hangry sometimes. And we can sometimes get a little bitey and a little feisty. I'll admit it, I'm one of them. You got to feed me. You can imagine how a hungry bear or a hungry lion is to, you know, finally get a hold of, of, of something that's going to taste so good. And then you've got this ruddy boy that comes chasing after you. Grabs you by the beard. Yanks the sheep out of your mouth. And so you rear up against him and he just, he just clubs you. So the battle, the biggest battle was not Goliath to David. The biggest battle is what he fought in the wilderness in preparation for what God had prepared for him. You know, lions and bears, they usually hunt at night. That's not in humans' comfort zone. I can't see well at night. You can barely see well during the day. I got to wear glasses. But they usually hunt in the, in the darkness of the night. They have better vision, or they have good vision at night. I mean, obviously they could see good in the day too, but it's the, uh, uh, the, the prey that they're after is weak at night. And so they know that, and they, they anticipate that, and they take advantage of the weakness of their prey, and so they hunt at night. And so you can imagine this bear, this lion comes and takes one of David's father's sheep in the middle of the night, and so David is chasing after this beast into the darkness. You see, it's, it's in the darkness that it's harder for us to fight. Nighttime is, is, is hard for a human being to fight, and that's exactly where the enemy wants to take you and I. You know, God, he called us out of the darkness into what? His marvelous light. But there's powers and principalities and things in this world that are trying to get us back into the darkness, get us back into where we came from, get us back into what God has already called us out of. And, and they're trying to, trying to get, get a hold of us and, and take advantage of our, our weakness and our situation that we're in and the trial and the tribulation that, that's set before us. And when our situation seems dire and there seems to be no hope and no way out. You know, sometimes we, we sit there and we go through things and we wonder where God is at. We wonder if God's really hearing our prayers. We wonder if God's really going to come through for us. I warn you, brother and sister, don't go back into the darkness. Don't go back into the darkness because there's a power and there's a spirit that likes to take us to things that from our past and our, our old life to try to trip us up and... and the enemy will use things in our in our in our past, such as old friends and our family work, family and, and co-workers who want to bring us back into the darkness out of God's marvelous light where he called us. Stay in the light. Stay in the light. Stay where God wants you to be. Stay in his word. Stay in his spirit. Stay in his church. Because the, the fight is so much harder in the darkness. And God has called you out of that. Do not go back to the darkness. Because it's so much harder to fight. But there's power of fighting in the light. Hallelujah. You know, David... I got to thinking, we're such a spoiled people, I guess you could say. You know, anything we want to research and look up, it's in the palm of our hands pretty much. You know, I was standing at door greeting the other day out there, and my brother had these fish on his shirt, and he thought they were paddlefish, and so I just looked it up. I said, yep, those are paddlefish, you know. Now we learned something today. But, you know, David, he couldn't sit there in the field while... Shepherd and his flock and cue up his iPhone and say, Hey Siri, how do you fight a bear? Hey Siri, how do you fight a lion? I mean, he couldn't even say, Hey Siri, how do you fight Goliath? There's no YouTube videos to watch. I'm a sucker for YouTube videos. Anything I'm going to do that I've never done before. You know, I even just, I went over to my stepmom's to change a battery in her, her 2018 uh, Envoy Saturday, and uh, of course I wasn't feeling the greatest, but I knew it wasn't going to be that big of a uh, deal, but I, I looked up on YouTube just to make sure I had all the tools with me, you know. We're such a spoiled people. 
We really are. You know, we're really just such a spoiled people. David didn't have those resources. David didn't have uh, Siri and Google at his fingertips. Uh, David uh, wasn't able to research, you know, the, the moves. You know, he didn't know that the bear could leap 36 feet and, and uh, you know, all the stats that I, I gave you, 400-some pounds. He didn't know how fast the bear could run necessarily other than what maybe he's observed in the, in the wilderness before. He didn't have that to his advantage like we have things of that nature to our advantage. All he had to go by was his own experiences that he had and those of the elders that had gone before him. All he had to rely on was his faith and trust in God. The experiences that he had with God and how God had delivered him and how God had, had be, uh, gone before him and made him victorious over this and that. That's all he had to rely on. And then the stories that he had heard of people of old time, how they trusted God, how they had faith in God, how they walked before God and lived for God, and how God had brought them out of their situation and out of their trial. Our elders have taught and given us examples of how battles are fought and won. We can look back at people who established churches and established uh, uh, you know, organizations as far as what we are a part of. And we can read in the Bible as far as you know, how the church started and, and how it progressed and how souls were added and, and how uh, you know, the, the world was evangelized and all that. But it all came basically down to praying, to fasting, and to trusting in God. That's what, what David was taught to David, I'm sure. That's what the examples that were set for us, I'm sure. Because it's a simple uh, uh, formula to pray, to fast, to trust in God. Be sensitive to God's spirit. Be sensitive to God's will and to what he wants you to do in your life. Amen. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. Ephesians 6 and 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we know. That's what we have as an example, praise God. We know that the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not carnal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know that uh, we can read and, and see the examples in the Bible of, of how they prayed, how they fasted, how they trusted in God to deliver them out of their situation. We can read about Paul and Silas in the prison. We can read about what Peter and, and James and John had, had gone through. We can read about all these different things and all these different people and all these examples of how God had brought people through by them trusting in the Lord. As David trusted in the Lord. It was physically impossible for David to defeat the Goliath. It was physically impossible for David to be able to fight a bear and the lion. He was not a very, as, as Brother Luke had mentioned, he was in his teenage years. He was not very big, not very strong, but he knew a God, and he had enough faith. And he knew that God would deliver him. And he knew that, that he would be victorious through God because God had done it before and he can do it again. He had examples in his life and stories that were told. Uh, um, you know, of uh, uh, David had the uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he had the examples of Joseph and, and Moses and Joshua. And we can read in, in Hebrews chapter 11 tells us how, how people had overcome things by faith. Amen. We can read in, uh, about the parting of the Red Sea and the, the parting of the Jordan River and, and how God provided the strength to overcome so many obstacles, so many situations that looked impossible. Caleb, amen, in, in Joshua chapter 14, being able to say, uh, give me this mountain at such a, a old age, but God had given him a promise. These are the things that David could hold on to to know that the battle is the Lord's and not his. You see, David's hardest battle wasn't the giant. As I have said, the giant moves like a man. He fights like a man. David's biggest battles were the past, fighting the lion and the bear, likely, as I said, in the dark. 
not sure how the beast is going to move, not sure how the beast is going to attack, not sure exactly uh, what's going to happen, but all he knew is he had a relationship with God, and he knew what his job was, was to protect his father's sheep. And he had a God who could protect him, and a God who could provide for him, and a God who could deliver him out of the hands of these beasts. Hallelujah. You know, I got to thinking. Sometimes I get myself in trouble that way. <coughs> thinking. You know, shepherds are usually, it's a family business. <coughs> the Bible doesn't really go into detail about David's older brothers, but uh, I'm sure at one point in time in their lives, they kept their father's sheep. And these three older boys, they, they were in Saul's army. This giant came out, defied the, the, the God of Israel. Heard the same words that David heard. He had to ser- heard the same uh, uh, threat that David heard. But there's something different in David. I often wonder what happened to to David's brother's sheep. What happened to their sheep? I mean, they were afraid of Goliath. They were afraid to fight the giant that defied their God. What kind of relationship did they have with God? You know, this is all speculation per se, but, you know, when a bear and a lion came against them and and stole their father's sheep, did they just say, oh, well, there's one more gone? I guess in my mindset that if if God had had done the same thing or they, they had a relationship with God, let me back up, if they had a relationship with God as David had and had faith in God like David had, And when those bears and those lions came and took their father's sheep like they did for David, and they went out and got the lamb out of the the bear's mouth and the lion's mouth, surely they would have had enough faith and trust in God that he could deliver them, deliver Goliath into their hands. So I wonder what happened to his brother's sheep. How much money was lost of his father's? because of a lack of relationship with God that his brothers may or may not have. And again, it's all speculation. Just a thought. Because your battle isn't necessarily the giant. Now I would agree with with Brother Luke, we've got to fight our giants. We've got to fight our trials. We've got to fight our tribulations. There's things that's going to come against us that that we've got to just dig our heels in and say, God, I know you are real. I know you are faithful. I know that you've done it before and that you're going to do it again. But the battle is not necessarily the giant that's in front of us. Our battle is what happened to us in the past. David's battle, his biggest battle, is fighting those those beasts out in the wilderness. How God had proved himself to David that he could do it once and that he could do it again. And And God has called us to such a higher place than where we, know, where we even can think and fathom where God wants us to go. And I want to tell you, and I want to encourage you, that God has already prepared you for where you're going to go. You've fought battles in the past. You've dealt with so much stuff in so many situations. But God has already given you the strength to face that giant that's set before you right now or that's going to be set before you in the future. Because if God has done it before, he can surely do it again. And it's always easy to think, oh, this thing's so hard when it's right in front of us. But that's what we thought about all the other battles, didn't we? That's what we thought about all the other trials and tribulations. They were so hard and and such a dire situation. And and how was God going to come through? But he did. Maybe not always in the same way that we think it ought to be. Maybe not always in the way that we anticipated or that we wished for, or that we hoped for, or that we prayed for, but God is faithful. God is faithful. Hallelujah. 
Your biggest battle isn't necessarily that giant. Your biggest battle is what happened in the past. Your biggest battle was you taking a turn for what's right. There's a battle going inside each and every single one of us at this altar. A battle between the old man and between the new. A battle for what you were and for what God wanted you to be. You were growing in the Lord or just learning about the Lord and you still had a lot of questions unanswered about who God was and how he can help you. But you know what you felt? You knew how you felt and you took that step of faith and battled the things of this world that had you bound. The addictions that had you bound, hallelujah, the sin that had you bound, the situations that had you tied to this world. God had set you free from those things. And maybe you're not quite to that point. Maybe you're not quite to that point where God has delivered you yet. Let me rephrase that, yet. Or let me repeat that, yet. Because God is able, if we are willing, to take that step of faith, to take that that battle that's set before us and say, God, I'm not quite sure uh, how things are going to work out and I'm not quite sure how situations are going to unfold, but I'm going to put my full faith and trust in you. Because I could tell you, as everyone can, can uh, witness to, it is life-changing when you decide to serve the Lord. It is life-changing when you kneel at this altar and repent of your sins. It is life-changing when you seek and receive that wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost. It's life-changing when you go down under the water in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. And I'm sure we can all look back to the people that we used to be, that old man that we used to be. And we can see where God has brought us from. And see, we can see where God has delivered us, what he has delivered us from. And we can remember that struggle inside. God, is this real? Is it really worth living for God? Is it really worth serving God? Is it really worth burying that old man? And becoming a new creature? I could tell you David believes it is. I could tell you that I believe it is. Because God has never, he's not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness. But he's long-suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. So that battle, that biggest battle... Is not what you're necessarily facing right now. And I know I'm not in your shoes. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to make light of anybody's situations. Because we, we, we have real battles. We have real struggles. Amen. We face real situations. It's not, it's not make-believe. It's, it's some life-changing decisions that we've got to make and, and we've got to go through and life-changing situations that, that we've got to face. But let me tell you that God is never going to leave us, never going to forsake us. He's always going to be there to help us to fight our battles. He's always going to be there to help us to fight the next Goliath that's sitting in front of us, to face the next giant that's sitting in front of us. Why do we know that? Why can I say that with such confidence? Because he already helped me slay the bear and the lion. He already helped me fight that beast in the wilderness. He already helped me when I wasn't fully involved and fully uh, uh, committed to the Lord's work and to his his, uh, uh, word and to his lifestyle. When I was out there in the wilderness battling some things, God was with me. When I was out there in the wilderness trying to figure things out, God was with me. Hallelujah. Just the same as he was with every single one of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. So the battle is not the Goliath that's set before us. Whatever appears to be your giant in your life today, we can see how God has brought us, what God has brought us from, what He has delivered us, what He has set us free. Hallelujah. And when our next trial comes, we can be as David is in verse 36. Hardy slew a bear. Hardy slew a lion. And this Philistine shall be like one of them. Hallelujah. Let's all stand.
Verse 47 that uh, Brother Luke had, had read says, The Lord saved not with sword and spirit. God doesn't need our weapons. He doesn't need our strengths. He doesn't need our abilities, but we need his. I don't know what you're facing tonight. I don't, what, I don't know what trial or tribulation you're going through. But I want to op open up these altars. I want to give us an opportunity to seek the Lord. The things that we have trusted in the Lord before, how, uh, what he has delivered us from. Remember those as we're on at, at the altar. Remember those as we're on our knees at home praying. God, you are faithful. God, you are real. God, you're able to beat my need. God, you're able to save me. God, you're able to deliver me. Just as you did for David, you could do for me. These altars are open. Let's all find a place to pray tonight. <laughs>